DNA structure. So we'll do a little bit of the history of DNA structure first, um, a little more. We've um, we finished a couple of um, interesting experiments, Hershey and Chase's experiment we just finished. And we're going to look a little bit at Chargaff right now. So this was in the early 1950s, and this is Erwin Chargaff. And his important contribution is known as Chargaff's rule. So here's what he said. He said in, in the DNA of any one organism, so in a human, for example, the number of G's equal the number of C's. So the number of guanines in your DNA will equal the number of cytosines. And also, the number of A's will equal T's. So the number of adenines that you have will equal the number of thymines. So this strongly hinted toward the base pair makeup of DNA. In other words, he didn't know the structure of DNA, but we do today now. And what he was saying is that for any person, or any organism, maybe an earthworm, however many A's they have, there are that many T's. And so this hinted toward this thing, that whenever you have an A, it pairs with a T. And whenever you have a T, it pairs with an A. And if you have a G, it pairs with a C. And a C would pair with a G. And another C, another G. So this is the, um, the base pair makeup that we're talking about. And that number was different from species to species. So he noticed that the proportions of GC and AT was the same within a species, but it was different from species to be species. So if you look at you, hi mom, um, maybe you have, I don't know, maybe you have 55% of your DNA as A's and T's. I don't know how many you have, but let's let's pretend here. And maybe you have 45% of your DNA that's G's and C's. Okay, great. If you're an oak tree, then maybe it's more like, um, I don't know, how about 49% AT and 51% GC or whatever. Um, so the base pairing percentages, um, A's and T's are always the same. See, A's and T's are always the same, but the percentage of it would be different in species to species. So that suggests that the code, whatever your code is, A, T, T, C, G, G, C, A, that code would be different from you um, to an oak tree. So that suggests that DNA, um, that, that the thing about DNA that codes for the hereditary information for making you the structure that you have um, is this series of bases. So this means that the variations that could provide the hereditary language for a cell were written in the sequence of bases. So here's some um, quiz time stuff. What did Chargaff's rule mean? It meant that A always binds with T, A always binds with C, or A always binds with G. And the right answer is A and T. Another question, um, what did Chargaff's rule mean? And we're supposed to choose two. So the order of bases is the same in each organism, meaning every organism has A, T, T, C, G, A, blah, blah, blah. That is definitely not true. The order of bases is different in each organism. That one is true. Each base binds with the same other base in every species. That means that A will always bind with T. And that is actually true. And C will always bind with G. That's true whether you're um, an earthworm or um, a grub or, um, I don't know, a lily of the valley. Each base binds with a different base. Nope. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense to you. So now we're going to look at Rosalind Franklin's work. So Rosalind Franklin uh, worked with Maurice Wilkins. Um, they did x-ray, they x-rayed DNA to figure out how it's put together. So they knew Chargaff's work and that A goes with T and C goes with G, but they really didn't know how it went together. So these folks, um, Rosalind Franklin um, crystallized DNA. So she would isolate DNA from whatever, I don't know what species, but she would isolate DNA and then she would crystallize it and then slice it and run it through, um, run an x-ray through it and, and take pictures of what it would look like. So these two work separately, and Rosalind's um, work was a little bit better, and so hers is the work that um, Watson and Crick used to figure out the, the structure. But here's what she did. She took her DNA and she crystallized it, and here's an x-ray, and you're putting an x-ray beam through it, and when you do that, it diffracts the x-rays, and then you can take a picture of it. And so this is a picture of um, a photograph of some of the DNA that she was looking at. 
So her work was the work that Watson and Crick used when they made their famous um, model of DNA that I'll show you next. So she showed that the DNA has a um, repeating nucleotide structure and that the helix has a certain diameter, a certain regular circumference. So it's always got about the same circumference. Her work was not recognized for many years because it was published after Watson and Crick's work. And um, they actually, the, the, the rumor goes that they stole her, um, her pictures, and uh, that's why they came out with their model first. So in 1953, um, Watson and Crick combined DNA uh, data to create um, a model of DNA um, called the double helix, and this is the model that we use today. So here's the structure that you need to know. So the structure of DNA is a double strand of nucleotides in a twisted ladder shape. We call it a double helix. Um, a helix is anything with kind of a twisty shape like that. Um, if you think of a staircase that goes up and twists along the way, that's really what we've got here. So you've got a ladder like this. And then just think about twisting this whole thing, and that's how you get your double um, twisted ladder your double helix. So the double helix is made out of nucleotides and each nucleotide is made out of a sugar. For DNA that sugar is deoxyribose, that's this part, and a phosphate, that's this part, and a base. Sometimes we call it a nitrogenous base. And so that's because there's nitrogen in it. So if you look along this double helix, we've got the sugar here, and a phosphate group here, and here's the base. So here's a nucleotide, and here's a nucleotide, and over here, here's a nucleotide, and here's a nucleotide. So these nucleotides go along the whole entire thing. You can see the outside is made out of sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate. and the inside are the bases. So the nitrogenous bases, there are three of them. <laughs> Bless you. There's adenine, thymine, which is in DNA, uracils in RNA, cytosine, and guanine. So A, C, and G are in both DNA and RNA. Thymine, <laughs> thymine's just in DNA, and uracil is just in RNA. And so this is the part that's the same in all the nucleotides, the sugar and the phosphate. And this is the part that's different. That's the base. And that base for DNA could be A, T, C, or G. And if it's RNA, it could be A, U, C, or G. So the sides of the ladder are alternating sugar and phosphate groups. So that sugar is ribose again. So you can see it here. Sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar. Let's do it here. Um, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate. So this entire outer part is sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate. And that's all covalently bonded and very strong. So those are all held together by the strong covalent bonds. And if you don't remember these, make a note that these are very strong. You want your DNA to be held together very tightly. The steps of the ladder, this tough. These are the bases, the nitrogenous bases. So that's A, T, C, G. Now the interesting thing here, it's all covalently bonded except this part. The way one base is held together by another base right here. Sometimes you have two bonds, sometimes you have three bonds. Those are all hydrogen bonds, and the reason is that sometimes you want to separate this out. Sometimes you want to unzip it so you can make more DNA or you can read the DNA. So the paired bases meet in the middle, and they are held together by weak hydrogen bonds. That's this stuff. That's why they're shown as dotted lines. More about nitrogenous bases. Um, you don't need to memorize these, but the doubled ring ones are adenine and guanine. They're purines. And so they have two rings. They're A or G. And the pyrimidines um, have a single ring, thymine and cytosine. And the way I remember this is the longer name has the smaller um, ring, if that helps at all. Um, okay. And so purines only bind with pyrimidines, and this is called complementary base pairing. And the reason is 
Let's go backwards a second and look at this. Remember, um, Rosalind Franklin found that the diameter is always, or the circumference is always about the same. And so if you had two of these binding, then you can picture that would be a lot bigger than two of these little ones binding, which would be like that. So the, the truth is neither of those happen. What you have is a big one binding with a little one. And that's how it always goes. Um, an A will always go with a T, and a G will always go with a C. And so you have a purine binding to a pyrimidine. The reason that A goes with T instead of with C is the number of bonds. Um, these will make um, a different number of bonds than these will make. So purines only, pa uh, only pair with pyrimidines, and this is called complementary base pairing. Three hydrogen bonds are required to hold guanine and cytosine together. And so you can see the three bonds. That's why G goes with C. Um, you get a big one and a little one, and you have three bonds, whereas A and T only make two. So let's take a look at that. So the reason that A and T go together is because of the way they're, sh they sh they're shaped. Um, they only form two hydrogen bonds. There's no place here for another hydrogen bond to be. So that's why they bond that way. So you can see the A and the T with two bonds, the C and the G with three bonds. Um, and notice the sizes, big always with little, big with little. So A always bonds with T and C with G. This keeps the diameter, or sorry, the radius, whatever, of the double helix the same. So notice when there are three hydrogen bonds between C and G, and there are only two hydrogen bonds between A and T. You don't need to memorize that, but I want you to get the idea because that's the reason that T goes with A. Um, the H is attracted to the N, that H is attracted that, to that O. This one has that with 3 here, and there's really no bond that's going to happen here because of the direction of where that hydrogen is. Question, if there's 30% adenine, how much cytosine is present? Okay, so we've got, we want to add up to 100%. So 30% is A, and you know that A equals T, so that means 30% is going to equal T. So altogether that's 60, so that means we have 40 left for G and C. And if you split that between the two, that means there's 20 for each of them. So I would want you to be able to figure that out for me. So the answer would be 20% cytosine. So adenine and thymine would both be 30%, adding up altogether to 60%, and guanine and cytosine would be 20% each, adding up to the extra 40%. So 60 plus 40 equals 100. I say that here too. So 60% A and T and 40% C and G, that equals 100%. More questions. What makes the size of the DNA ladder? And pause this and figure out what you think, and I will just tell you it's the sugar and phosphate. You could call it the deoxyribose and the phosphate, or the pentose sugar. What type of bond holds the sugar and the phosphates together along the sides of the DNA ladder? So here's the DNA ladder. And everything, everything has a very strong bond except the middle. So that means we're talking about the sides here. So that's covalent bonds. Covalent bonds are strong. What makes the rungs of the DNA ladder? Um, so a rung for a ladder, for those of you who don't spend a lot of time climbing ladders, the rung is this part that you walk on. And so those are the bases nitrogenous bases, because they have nitrogen in them. What type of bond holds the nitrogenous bases together in the middle um, of the DNA ladder? And those are the weak ones, the hydrogen bonds. The reason that DNA has weak bonds in the middle is that somehow you've got to unzip this thing when you want to read it and then zip it back up together, and you don't want to have really hard, strong bonds to do that. Hydrogen bonds are weak. Is it easier to break the DNA molecule at the hydrogen bonds in the middle or to break the covalent bonds on the side? And the answer is you want to break the hydrogen bonds in the middle. That way you can read it. But you don't want your DNA coming totally apart. That would be bad. So now look at the five carbon atoms. Um, you know what? We're about to get into some hard stuff. Um, so I think I'm going to stop right here.